righty, I think we'll go ahead and get started with our next, I have an NMR workshop on NMR pipe, analyzing all that data. Uh, so welcome to our 59th meeting. I'll just get started and hand things over to John for a word from our sponsor. Th th thank you, Dave. And uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you may be. Okay, so why don't we just get going and I'll hand things over to Frank. Thanks very much. Greetings, everyone. And of course, many thanks to MR Resources and the Ivan folks for another opportunity to talk about spectroscopy, processing and analysis. So let's look at some things. What we will do today is have an overview of some of the analysis facilities in the NMR pipe software and talk a little bit about how they're used. Then we'll actually operate the software and see some examples of these things. And by and large, most of the examples that we will see today are in the NMR pipe demo data archive, which is the best place to go to look for examples for how to accomplish a particular kind of analysis. And as last time, I'm speaking to you from the Institute of Bioscience and Biotechnology Research, which is an institute run jointly by the National Institute of Standards and Technology and the University of Maryland. And so if you find any of this interesting, and you know some folks who are interested in postdoctoral positions, send them our way. And also, as before, the software and analysis tools that we will see today have been under development for more than 20 years, and lots of folks have contributed to them, including several people on the call right now. So anyone who's looking, if you see your name on the list, Thank you very much indeed. Now we looked at this list last time, an overview of the typical kinds of processing and analysis tasks and ones that can be addressed with the facilities of NMR pipe. And the ones highlighted in yellow here are the ones that we're gonna emphasize today, but this will be an informal demonstration. So if there are particular things that folks are interested to see later on when we're doing software demonstrations, by all means, call out uh, by unmuting yourself or type something in the chat and folks will be uh, monitoring the chat so they can ask these questions. We're gonna talk a lot about peak detection, spectral modeling, and analyzing spectral series. And we'll be analyzing spectral series with line shape fitting methods and also with principal component analysis. The main graphical interface of the software is called NMR Draw. And we saw last time how we can use this interface to build and execute processing schemes interactively this same interface can also be used to perform peak detection and to edit peak tables. And we're going to learn about that today. Another important graphical interface in the software is the interface called SpecView. This is a special purpose graphical interface that's intended to display 1D or 2D spectral series and to perform principal component analysis on selected regions of those spectra. And the point of this interface, as we will see, is to be able to separate spectra according to their similarities and differences and use the principal component scatter plot as a way to navigate and select spectra to figure out why particular spectra are similar or different from each other. And this same graphical interface we will see can also be used to take known assignments and superimpose them on a new peak table. And we'll explain why we uh, do this sort of thing in this particular way when we talk about how NMR pipe fits spectral data to line shape models. Now, something interesting about this graphical interface 
It is actually a big script written in the TCLTK scripting language, the magnificent little scripting language that was introduced to the NMR community by our friend and hero, Bruce Johnson, author of NMR View and NMR View J. So thank you, Bruce, for bringing us this delightful scripting language. So NMR Pipe has a version of this scripting language to which we have added about 300 different custom commands to manipulate spectral data, to read uh, general purpose tables and PDB structures, and to perform spectral graphics. And taken together, these tools allow us to build most any kind of interface to perform a processing or analysis task. So many things we're gonna to see today are actually big complicated scripts to do interesting things like this spec view interface is. A simpler graphical interface that we might take a look at is an interface called spec versus spec. And it's simply an interface for plotting two related spectra intensity versus intensity and reporting statistics of the results. We do a lot of spectral comparisons in this lab, so we like this kind of tool. And it's possible to write all sorts of custom analysis. For example, this custom analysis to analyze STD spectra. And this application is very nice. It automatically goes across the spectrum and finds whatever local scaling is needed to map an on-resonant spectrum down into the same intensity as the off-resonant spectrum. So what you see here is the original STD data in red and black and the rescaled version of the data in red and black and the differences in the original intensities and the rescaled intensities let us compute a kind of percent STD in a local way for all of the individual peaks. So this is a completely automated result. Now, although we largely talk about spectral processing and analysis, NMR pipe was developed in a lab that also helped to develop the methods that we use to exploit residual dipolar couplings. And so in case this is interesting to any of the folks in the audience, NMR Pipe actually has extensive facilities for manipulating dipolar couplings, estimating tensors. And in fact, um, to support the work that we've done in residual dipolar couplings uh, in those earlier days, we also have facilities to manipulate structures, test their agreement with measured dipolar couplings, and even do simple molecular dynamics calculations that will refine a structure to better match um, a given list of experimental dipolar couplings. But just as an example, to show what these are good for, these are two competing structures of a small protein and one of them is correct, one of them is incorrect. Both of these two versions of the structure actually have the same secondary structure. They have helices and sheets in about the same places, but it's the overall tertiary fold of these two that's different. And one of the helices in the correct model is bent. It wraps around one of the other helices in the protein. So one thing that we can do is use dipolar couplings to quickly validate a structure. So what you see on the top here, is the dipolar couplings fit to the good structure. If we try to take those dipolar couplings and fit them to the bad structure, they don't fit. Furthermore, we can see that dipolar couplings will allow us to differentiate very fine structural details that are hard to determine with just NOE distances. So for example, if we take data just for this little bent helix here and fit it to the dipolar couplings, 
we get good results. But if I took these same dipolar couplings and fit them to an arbitrary ideal straight helix, they don't fit anymore. So we may see some examples later on of how the fine details of a structure can be revealed by um, dipolar couplings. And as part of all of this dipolar coupling manipulation, and our pipe has several nice utilities for manipulating PDB files, including building an extended structure for a given sequence, adding protons to an existing structure, and analyzing a structure in terms of its secondary structure classifications, hydrogen bond network, and so on. And maybe we'll see an example of that. But again, here is an example of a secondary structure report produced by a facility in NMR pipe. And if you look closely, what you'll see is the sequence of the protein of interest colorized according to which parts are in a helix or a sheet and specific structural details like end caps or beta turns are also identified and labeled. Uh, and in addition, let's see some other things like whether or not a given residue is in the most populated areas of Ramachandran space or whether or not a residue is a solvent exposed one. And along these same lines, we have facilities for displaying a structure as a trajectory in phi psi space. And this is actually very nice for looking at bundles of structures where the overall three-dimensional structure is almost identical but particular locations within the structure may have different choices of phi and psi angles. Now, here's an example of some other things that we could do with the facilities in NMR pipe and the scripting language. This is a picture of a graphical application that was built as a prototype for analyzing optical spectroscopy data. Okay, and so what you see here are images from a stack of optical spectroscopy data of a picture of someone's hand. So each plane in this series represents a different frequency of light that's being viewed. And what you see in the graph down here is that we're moving through the planes, which are the different frequencies of light. So when you look at these individual planes, you don't really see very much difference. But we can perform principal component analysis on this stack of images. And the first component image that we get is kind of an average image across the series. It looks just like a single grayscale image. But now, interestingly, if we look at the second component image, it happens to highlight the fact that whoever this person is, they have a rubber band around one finger, which changes the blood flow to that finger. So when we look at this particular second component image, we can see that that finger is darker because it's a different color. Very hard to tell that from any one of these grayscale images, but when we combine all the information using principal component analysis and display the result, we can get something interesting and clear. And so we segment the hand, the dark part, and the rubber band. Very nice. Uh, something else that we've uh, kind of done in part for fun is build tools that will import spectral data into virtual reality environments. And we started to do this work more than a decade ago and did one or two useful things. And we're in the process now of doing it with actual virtual reality headsets as uh, an environment to visualize spectral data and molecules. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so let's get to discussing specific kinds of analysis. And in our previous talks, we explained that in a two-dimensional experiment, 
Somewhere we have a pair of RF pulses and we systematically increment the evolution time between them. And at each of these evolution times, we acquire a 1D spectrum. And the point of these increasing evolution times is to modulate the signals across this series of 1D spectra, such that when we Fourier transform the rows of this measurement, we get an interferogram where we can see a given signal modulate in intensity in this indirect dimension. And then when we Fourier transform this in the indirect dimension, we get a 2D spectrum. Now, the implication of this in practice is that when we think about a signal in a multidimensional data set, for instance, a 2D signal, even though we have a 2D measurement, Everything that we know about the signal can be described as a pair of one-dimensional profiles, one for each of the two dimensions. And so in the time domain, the directly detected dimension, a signal from there, has a sinusoid profile, and that signal has another sinusoid profile in the indirect dimension, and it's the product of these two that gives us our time domain matrix. If we Fourier transform all the rows of this thing, we get an interferogram. And now the one dimensional profile that represents the signal is a line shape. And in the indirect dimension, it's still a sinusoid. So again, we have a 2D matrix, but in terms of the information content there, we only need two of these 1D profiles to describe it. In this case, a line shape in one dimension and a sinusoid in the other. And then finally, when we Fourier transform all the columns of this, we generate a spectrum. And once again, we have a two dimensional matrix, but we can describe all the points in that matrix as the product of these two one dimensional line shapes. So, Keep this in mind because we can take advantage of this when we try to build mathematical models to fit spectral data. And now for a message from our sponsor, Q1 Instruments. Q1 is dedicated to developing NMR systems from 400 to 600, as well as full system upgrades from 300 to 600 as well. You can get a lot of features in a two-channel NMR spectrometer at a great price. So we invite you to get to know more. Contact us at q1americas.com or info at q1americas.com by email. Thank you. So for example, let's consider a 2D relaxation series. And in a series like this one, we have a collection of peaks over a set of planes. And each peak stays in the same place, but its intensity changes over the course of the planes. So this pseudo 3D data can now be described as the product of three different profiles. A line shape profile for the directly detected dimension, a different line shape profile for the indirect dimension, and an intensity evolution profile in the, in the pseudo 3D dimension. And now we can fit this entire 3D volume of data in terms of three one-dimensional functions. And in the course of a spectral modeling application, a spectral fitting application, we can generate a 1D profile and adjust its position and line width in this direction, and a 1D profile, and adjust its position and line width in this direction, and extract a set of amplitudes. And we don't need a particular model. We can just find whatever intensity value gives the best match to the spectrum. So we build a pseudo 3D signal as the product of three profiles and we determine what those three profiles are during line shape fitting. Now, that's the special case of 
an experiment where the 2D peaks stay the same over a series of measurements. But there are other kinds of experiments where we have collections of peaks that move from one spectrum to another. And so we want to follow the changes in position and possibly even the changes in intensity and line width at the same time. So in this case, we have a special purpose application that performs peak detection of all the spectra in the series and makes an initial guess for a given peak where that peak is in all of the other spectra. So we'll see an example of this. But once this identification is performed, we can extract the evolution of these peak positions and fit them to various curves. Now, in previous presentations, we've talked about principal component analysis, and we'll see several applications today. And you will recall that principal component analysis allows us to take a collection of related spectra and distill them down to help reveal the trends and similarities between them. And there are two ways that we view the results of a principal component analysis. In one way of viewing the results, we have a scatter plot where each point in the scatter plot represents one entire spectrum. And that scatter plot is generated by a high dimensional representation of the spectra, where the spectra are represented in a multi dimensional space where that space has as many dimensions as there are intensities in the spectrum. So a spectrum with a thousand points is represented as one object in a thousand dimensional space. And we can take this large high dimensional space and project it down to a small number of dimensions in order to get a graphical summary of what's happening. Another way to display the results of principal component analysis is to realize that another way of looking at principal component analysis is as a spectral decomposition method. In other words, a principal component for a spectral series is a single spectrum that's a linear combination of all the spectra in the series. And the factors that are used to combine the spectra are whatever factors are needed to minimize the least squares difference between the component spectra and all the spectra of the series. In other words, we try to generate a spectrum that's as close as possible to the entire series. And the scaling factors that we extract are actually the values that are used in the scatter plots. So these are the score values. This is called the loading spectrum. When we generate one of these loading spectra, we can then subtract that loading spectra from each of the spectrum in the series to generate a residual. And we can repeat this procedure over and over again, generating new component spectra and new sets of scores for an additional dimension in a scatter plot. So we have two ways to view PCA results in terms of the scatter plot or in terms of these component spectra. And we will see some very useful things that we can do with that kind of visualization. Now, NMR pipe has a huge learning curve and there are a lot of things that are really obscure about it. That said, it's possible to build very intricate processing and analysis schemes with the script-based tools of uh, NMR pipe. And here's one example with a related collection of one-dimensional spectra. And in this case, they're spectra of different monoclonal antibody samples. Okay, so... In this case, we have three different samples with five spectra each. And in order to analyze them well, the spectra have to be aligned as 
well as possible with each other. So let me show you this elaborate scheme for getting the best alignment that we uh, could come up with in this case. So we start with our spectra, we auto phase them, and we blank out the solvent region. So we have this collection of spectra, and now we want to align them. So what we can do within each class is pick one of the spectra as a reference spectrum and align all of the other spectra to it. And we can pick one arbitrarily. We can pick the one that has the uh, greatest amount of overall intensity, whatever method we use. After we align all of the spectra within a class, we generate a class average spectrum for each of the three samples. And then we go through a second alignment where we align each spectrum in the class to its class average spectrum. And why do we do this? The reason we do this is when we pick a spectrum within a class, and align the other spectra to it. The spectrum that we've chosen as a reference aligns perfectly with itself. And so as a result, that spectrum behaves differently from the others when you look at the results of an alignment. So instead of aligning all the spectra within a class, to one of the spectra in the class. We align all of the spectra in a class to the class average spectrum. And that gets rid of the problem of a reference spectrum within the class behaving differently from all the others. So after we get those class average spectra, we align them to each other and use that alignment to finally align all of the spectra in each of these three classes and scale everything together. And the point of this is, if we look at the principal component analysis of the initial spectral data, you could see that um, clusters are broad because the spectra are not perfectly aligned. And especially for this red cluster, they're actually separated. <clears throat> Excuse me, but after this elaborate alignment scheme, we have tight alignment and very small clusters. So uh, I go through these details so you can understand the intricacy of the kind of schemes that it's possible to build with the tools that we'll see today. So at this Frank, point, Frank, I have a yes, Frank, yeah, yeah. This is Krish. I have one quick question. Yeah, when you do the average. Um, when you do, take an average spectrum to align, is that a point by point average of all the spectra in the uh, in that set? Yes, it is. It in is the spectral domain in the spectral domain. It I is. Assume. Yeah, and that the class average spectrum is not particularly important. It, it's just an arbitrary, um, reasonable looking spectrum that we can align all of the spectra in a, a given sample okay. to. So we we, we don't okay. expect that there's any special information content in the class average spectrum. It's just used as a, a kind of tool or reference point. Okay. Could you, could you do that with a sum? Uh, I don't see why not. Yeah, I mean, an average is a sum yeah. really. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so let's oh, let's. So can I ask a question as well? Hello, I I couldn't hear what that was. I uh, can I also ask a question? I'm sorry, I still can't understand. Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Yes, so uh, these different spectra that you're aligning in different classes, uh, do they represent different states 
of the protein? No, they represent like different, different samples. They're just replicate measures on the same sample. Yes. So there are so three samples. Different... There are three samples with five measurements for each sample. Yeah, and these classes, uh, they are different structural classes, like they're different structural ensembles. No, the they're not different protein? structural ensembles. They're three different proteins that are very similar to each other. They're all monoclonal oh. antibodies, three different monoclonal antibodies. Right, right. But you can do that with uh, the same protein as well, right? Like different structures of the same protein. I guess it depends on what it is that what kind of information that you're trying to extract. Right. Got. Thank you. Yep. This is part of an exercise where we're trying to measure the degree of similarity in the spectra between related molecules. Uh, for example, in our case, we're interested in things like whether one antibody drug is structurally equivalent to another antibody drug. And we do this by spectral comparisons. So that's the motivation of this particular example. But thank you. Yep. Good question. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Screen is shared. Yes. So let's look at an example. And to start with, we'll look at a 2D spectrum. So here's a 2D spectrum. And I'm going to scroll with the mouse wheel to set the contour levels such that I see all the peaks I care about and not too many of the noise peaks. Okay. And then under the peak detection menu, I'll use this peak detection option. And that gives us a little pop up here. And all we need to do is press the detect button and that will perform peak detection on this 2D data set. The peak detection is very simple. It just looks for local maxima. We can adjust many different settings, though, that decide, for instance, how big of a region uh, we look to see that one point is larger than its neighbors. And we also have options to try to statistically identify peaks that are likely due to noise. And those are the cases that you see labeled with asterisks here. And we also have uh, uh, options to simply reject those noise peaks if they're identified as such. And the peak table that we've generated has many different values in it that can all be displayed on the screen. For instance, the chemical shifts in the two dimensions here, in this case, proton and carbonyl. And the peak height is in here. And there's room for an assignment, which right now is empty. We'll talk about this a little later. And importantly, we have a, a parameter called the cluster ID. Okay. And I will expand the region of the spectrum so that we can look more closely. The cluster ID is a parameter that defines which groups of peaks will be fit simultaneously when we later on try a line shape model. And so as we're going to see, when we want to model a spectrum, we will iteratively build the peak table, perform a uh, line shape fitting, view the results, and then go back and edit the peak table as needed. And the things that we will do in editing the peak table are insert peaks that are missing, delete peaks that we don't need, and potentially change the cluster ID numbers to change which peaks are fit simultaneously. 
So we have this initial peak table. The line shape fitting is done non-interactively at the command line. And it's done by a application called autofit.tcl. And like all the other applications, if you invoke it with the help argument, you can see all of the different command line options that it has. This application can fit 1D, 2D, 3D, and 4D data, which means it can also fit uh, pseudo 3D and pseudo 4D data. And it has Gaussian line shapes, Lorentzian line shapes, and line shapes based on time domain uh, data that's Fourier transformed in the same way that the experimental spectrum was. So let's do a simple fit where we tell it what the spec name is and the name of the peak table that we made. And it's performed the fit. It happened pretty quickly. In addition to performing the fit, the program has generated simulated data and a residual that we can inspect. And there's a application or a script called view fit that will display those results. And now a message from our sponsor, MR Resources. Uh, MR Resources into uh, 38 or 39 years at uh, this point and uh, offering uh, reconditioned NMR spectrometers, uh, system relocations, uh, quench recovery. Uh, they also have a uh, very nicely uh, and fully equipped uh, probe shop, uh, can take care of any and all repairs on uh, uh, both room temperature probes and uh, cryo probes, as well as uh, uh, cryo platforms. So what we have here is three copies of NMR Draw working in synchronization. And on the left-hand side, we have the measured data. In the middle, we have the spectral line shape model that was fit to the data. And over here, on the right-hand side, we have the residual, the difference between the measured data and the molecule. So the thing to do at this stage is to expand the parts of the residual that seem to have some substantial intensity. And let's get our original peak table. And so what I see, I can move a cursor around. If I point to where these residuals are, I can look over here and see, oh, look at that. There's an unresolved peak that's missing. So I will turn on peak editing and insert a peak here. And if I go a little lower in contours, I also see that there's probably an overlap peak here. I'll insert that. And now I will save this peak table that we created, the edited peak table and try the fit again and look at the results. And then I would continue and check any parts of the spectrum that still seem to have a reasonable residual. And in most cases, it will be because there's an unresolved peak in the spectrum that needs to be inserted. So save this new peak table. And again, repeat the procedure, fit the spectrum and view the result. And there's some tiny little bits left. We might not be able to fix everything, uh, but over here, let's see. I will insert a peak here. And maybe a peak here too. 
and try once again to save that peak table and repeat the line shape model. All right, I bet I can improve that a little bit, but you get the idea. So this is how we can iteratively fit spectral data, and the measured data, the model, the residual, not so bad. And the point of this is that this allows us to extract um, accurate information, even in cases where there is substantial overlap between the peaks. So one of the cases where this is particularly valuable are circumstances where you want to quantify spectral data in detail, such as with a relaxation experiment, where we have a series of related spectra where the intensities evolve. Okay. There are many ways to measure these data. In this case, I'm going to work with a T1 relaxation experiment that was measured as a single interleaved pseudo 3D data set. And we've already seen previously how we can generate conversion scripts and processing scripts for this kind of data. And by the way, for processing this spectral series, we can do it with a single command. It's our command that generates 2D processing schemes in the pseudo 3D mode. And so in this case, we give it a pseudo 3D input and a pseudo 3D output, and then the parameters for processing the spectral data. In this case, I use the first plane of the series to choose auto phasing values and then extract that auto phasing value and use it for the entire spectral series. So when I do that, here's uh, the spectrum. So here's the first plane, second plane, third plane, four, five, six, seven, eight nine, 10, and back to one. So you can see the peaks get smaller. We can look at vectors from down along the Z axis also and point to a particular peak and see how that peak is evolving across the planes. Now, if we want to build a fitting application, use a fitting application that fits the pseudo 3D data, we start by building a 2D peak table that's representative of the series. So most typically we might do that from the first plane in the spectrum. And I've already built a peak table for this data And I went through the same procedure that we saw, carefully editing the peak table until I could make a good model of the spectrum. And in this case, just the first 2D plane. Now, as we discussed, this peak table has room for assignments in it, but how do we get the assignments in there? Well, an NMR pipe peak table is associated with a particular data set and it has values in it that are in points the locations of the peaks in points the bounding box of the peaks in points so all the details of this peak table are for a specific spectrum for the spectrum that was used to generate the peak table and uh, in case you are interested 
This table is just space separated columns and each of the column has a name. So this is a, a standard format of an NMR pipe peak table. Now, if we have a pre-existing set of assignments, that list of assignments can be in more or less any kind of table, but we expect that somewhere in the table, there's a column that has the x-axis chemical shift, a column that has the y-axis chemical shift, and a column that has the assignment that's associated with that particular chemical shift. So the assignment table is a list of chemical shifts and assignments. The peak table is a specific list of the peak parameters that are associated with a given spectrum. And so if we want to have assignments in the peak table, we use an application that takes that assignment table and maps it onto the peak locations. And it will start by making a best guess as to where the assignments go. And then we'll display the results and adjust them interactively. And the way we do that is with the spec view interface. So in this example, I'm going to use a script that automatically builds a peak table, use a script that tries to give the best match between the known assignments and the peaks in that peak table, and then use the spec view graphical interface in a form where it will display the peaks in the peak table and the assignments in the assignment table and allow us to manipulate them. So let's see what that looks like. All right, so here's the result. I can expand on this. And what you'll see is the values that are in gray are the peaks from the peak table. And the values that are in green are the assignments from the assignment table. And the application has made an initial guess as to what assignments belong to a particular peak. So let's expand this here, for example. There are two assignments here, um, Q121 and E54. This peak was given both of those assignments as an option. But I can look at this and say, oh no, this peak is definitely E54. So that's what I'd like to select. And what I do is first click on the assignment and that becomes the active assignment, it's in red. And now if I left click on this peak, it changes its assignment to the one that I've selected. And the results have been saved in a new peak table. So in this application, we can go through the spectra and make all of these adjustments to the peak table until every peak we care about has a unique assignment associated with it. And now we can use that new peak table that has the assignment information in it for any subsequent analysis steps. So in this case, let's see. We'll use the auto fit program again. And this time it's in series mode because we're fitting a pseudo 3D series. But other than that, we have the input table like we did before and the input spectrum, which in this case is the pseudo 3D series. So let's try that. 
And now it's fitting the pseudo 3D volumes in the way that we discussed before. Each peak is being modeled according to three one-dimensional profiles. And those profiles are 1D line shapes in two dimensions and an amplitude evolution in the pseudo 3D dimension. And so now when we view the results of the fit, in this case, the simulated data, that measured data is pseudo 3D. So here's the first plane and I'm gonna move through the planes. Here's the second plane, third plane, fourth plane, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, 10. And let's expand the region so we can see a little bit about what's going on. So again, here's plane one, and this is the measured data, the simulation, and the residual. And I'll go through the planes, plane five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So in this short amount of time, we've extracted intensity evolution profiles for more than 100 peaks across 10 different spectral planes. And now we can use an application called Show Evolve that will read this output table that was created by the pseudo 3D analysis and display the different evolution curves that have been extracted from the data. And any of these can be passed on to simple XY fitting to fit them to simple uh, functions like in this case, a single exponential decay. Okay, so that's individual analysis of relaxation curves. But let's have a look at this data by using the spec view interface. And here are all the 10 spectra in this series in overlay. I can expand them. We can turn one or the other of them on, whatever. I'm gonna take this spectral series as it is and do principal component analysis on it. And what we expect to see is some kind of continuous behavior from the long relaxation time to the short relaxation time. And in fact, that is indeed the kind of thing that we see when we look at component one and two. But the interesting thing now is in addition to looking at this scatter plot, let's look at the corresponding PCA spectra, the loading spectra, which I can you do by pressing this button, show PCA spectra. And this is now the first component spectrum. And generally speaking, this first component spectrum is going to be much like an average spectrum. This shows all the amplitudes, all the signals in common across the spectral series, okay? So this looks very much like you would expect. But now the higher components are going to show the parts of the spectrum that differ from the behavior of these peaks. So in other words, now, if I go and look at the spectrum for principal component two, I'm gonna lower the contour levels a bit. This shows me particular peaks in the spectrum whose amplitude evolutions are different 
So without doing any analysis of individual exponential rates, I can quickly look at this result. and point to particular signals in here. And figure out which part of the spectrum they belong to. So for example, the PCA is telling us that this peak has different relaxation behavior than some of the other ones. And here, let's look at this. So that's that's why, look at this. It actually went negative. So that's obviously an artifact. Oh, this is, I'm sorry. These are not the evolutions. This is the PCA spectrum. Silly me. But anyway, so... This is a valuable thing about PCA. It quickly allows us to identify parts of the spectra that are behaving differently from the other parts of the spectrum. So far, so good. Any questions? All right, let's look at another example. NMR pipe has many facilities for generating simulated data. And we've used these for different purposes, like to help generate data for the NUSCON spectral reconstruction contest. So here's an a simple little example. And this example is going to start with a chemical shift table. Much like an assignment table. Uh, this is the kind of chemical shift input table that folks use for running the Talos program to predict protein secondary structure. But you look at this information, you could see it's relatively straightforward. Each entry in this table has a residue ID, a residue name, an atom name, and a corresponding chemical shift. Very simple. Now, we have a utility called CS to peak that makes simple chemical shift tables, simple peak tables from chemical shift tables according to particular patterns. So if I type CS to peak dot help, you can see some of the different kinds of spectra that we can simulate based on the chemical shift positions that are in the chemical shift table. Now for these simulations, there's no intensity information. So the intensities are uniform for all the signals. But in this case, let's look at what we have. When I run this program, cs2peak.tcl, with that chemical shift table, I'm going to tell it to generate the peak table for an HNCA spectrum. And it's generated... a peak table that has peaks listed in all the positions where you'd expect to find one in an HNCA spectrum. And it's generated a script that simulates time domain data based on the information in that peak table. And this simulation looks very much like the same parameters that are used to convert um, data from the spectrometer into the NMR pipe format. So we can use the same kind of parameters that we use to convert spectral data to make simulated data that matches that spectral data. So 
So I'm running the script that generates that time domain data. And now it's being Fourier processed. And there is our nice synthetic HNCA spectrum. So you can see there's a pair of strips drawn for each residue and the, the, a pair of peaks for each one of these cases. So simulated data, very good. We can do that in 1D, 2D, or 3D. And as we've uh, seen last time, we can also take any of these simulated data sets and resample them as if they were non-uniformly sampled measurements. All right, what else can we look at today? This is an interesting application called Sierra. And actually, it's probably handy if we look at a little explanation. In previous discussions, we've talked about the SMILE approach for analyzing non-uniformly sampled data. And the way the SMILE program works is that it starts with a spectrum and iteratively tries to approximate that spectrum with a series of line shapes that are based on exponentially decaying data that's Fourier transformed in the same way as the experimental data. So we can have a complex and not completely phased signals from the measured data like we see here and SMILE will approximate this shape by adding as many different terms as it's needed to describe this. So what you see here in these little postage stamps are the individual signal terms that SMILE creates to build up this model to match the measured data. And as it adds more and more terms, you can see the residual gets smaller and smaller. So usually that is used for non-uniform sampling reconstruction. But there's something else that we can do, which is that we can use the SMILE model to analyze the spectrum and then choose just a subset of those results to simulate some signals that we don't want in the spectrum and then subtract them. Frank, there is a question in the chat. What Andy, is the question? Do you want to, Andy, do you want to go ahead and, and ask? Sure. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is great stuff, Frank. Um, yeah, I have a just a question. Um, is there like a way to interactively assign the backbone of a protein with NMR draw, um, you know, using the standard suite of like an HSQC, HNCACB, HNCO, CACB, HNCA, et cetera? There are some, there are some tools to do this, but honestly, I wouldn't recommend it because they're not really very polished, but I can show you what they, uh, I, I can give you an idea of what they look like uh, when we're done with this part of the demonstration. Great, thanks. Okay, so what do we have here? Let's see. This is the experimentally measured data. And what we would like to do are get rid of some of these signals here. And the signals that we're going to subtract 
are signals for excipient molecules. So this is a monoclonal antibody spectrum in the presence of some excipients, and we don't want the excipient signals there. So we use SMILE to model the whole spectrum. And then we isolate only those signals that are associated with the excipient simply by expressing a, a range of chemical shift values that we should keep. And then we can subtract those from the spectral data. And you'll see we remove all of these. So there's what stuff looked like at the very beginning. And here are the excipient signals. And at the end, here's what things look like after those are subtracted. OK, so. Is there a way? Uh, by the same method, can we subtract the diagonals? Subtract the diagonals. Yes, there, yeah. there, there would be a way to subtract diagonals. Um, potentially more than one way, in fact, to subtract diagonals. Uh, and we could do it with a, a 1D model. Um, I... Uh, this is such a great question. I don't have an example to show. So maybe it's something we could talk about at a, a future meeting. But the two ways to do it, uh, one simple way would just be to generate a one-dimensional spectrum and use that to generate a two-dimensional spectrum, which is the product of those two. So that would make a diagonal all by itself. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah, that will be very useful, you know, uh, right. especially for the 3D noses of proteins. Thank you so much. Yeah, Yeah, it is a it is a great idea. Uh, uh, I'm going to keep it in mind for next time. Okay, so Andy wanted to talk about assignment. And let's see if I can find something of interest here. And it's because I don't like Sparky. There's, so what I'm gonna show you has some useful facilities in it, but the, it is just not a substitute for using a program like Sparky. It's not a substitute for that kind of software in its current form. So let's see if I can find something In the processing demo, you recall that we've seen the strip viewer and we used it in processing as a way to get an overview of the spectral data so that we could test to see whether or not the peaks are phased in all directions everywhere in the spectrum. The strip viewer also has some assignment features. So we can display tables, contents of tables, and we can display cursors that are associated with the chemical shifts of particular peaks. And importantly, we can take these results and take a group of strips and move them around. So in this interface, we can change the order of the strips. And we have some functions that will make a guess about what the next best alignment is. So 
Uh, and every time we make a change in the order of these strips, the results get saved on the disk. We can turn on cursors that will help us do things like And let's say I want to find the peaks that line up with these. So I'll move this cursor here. And now I can scroll across the spectrum and try to find cases where there are other peaks at that position. So, Andy, that's the extent of what we can do with the tools that are in here. Uh, just manipulate strips and the order of them in a protect in a potential assignment. So I would say that these Thanks. tools are probably more useful for verifying and inspecting an assignment than they are for generating the assignment from scratch. But it's a good question. And out of curiosity, what what features of an assignment program? are not available to you now that you would like to see? Well, it's the the Sparky interface. I don't know if I'm the only one that doesn't like the Sparky interface, but it's it's so cumbersome. Whereas, you know, your interface that you just showed just now with the scroll.com, um, to me, that's just such a such a such a more pleasing and intuitive interface. Thank you. Yes. So I think it, it, it's worth considering. Um, I've kind of avoided the spectral assignment problem in the last four or five years, because in the lab where I work, it's primarily focused on unlabeled proteins and the kind of measurements that we can do with unlabeled proteins. But more recently, we're going back to traditional structural biology uh, in particular, because in our case, we can finally make uh, labeled monoclonal antibodies to study. So you may see some more assignment-based applications next That'd be time great. We get together and talk. So great. yeah, thank you for that encouraging uh, comment and question. Thanks. Can you do a 3D uh, peak picking also? Sure. Yeah. yeah, let's do that. Which is linked to the 2D in some way or the other? No, um, we don't have to do that. So I'm going to just quickly process. An experiment, a 3D measurement here and run NMR draw. So here's uh, a plane from our 3D data. This is a CBCANH. I'll just go through and draw all the planes so that you can see them. Okay, so that's kind of like a projection of this 3D data. And what I'll do is go to this peak detection menu that we've seen before and change the number of dimensions to three. And then press the detect button. So here's the peak table that we made. And as I scroll through the planes in the 3D spectrum, you can see the peak labels change. And what you might notice if you look closely is some peaks are labeled with a star as before. Those are peaks that the program decided are likely to be random noise or truncation artifacts. And these peaks have a label here. If I move forward or backward in the spectrum, you'll see that the label has a greater than or less than sign at the beginning. That means the maximum of that peak is at a previous plane or next plane in the data.
And just like before, we can see any of the parameters that are in the peak table. So they're the chemical shifts in each of the three dimensions. And the heights. So in practice, it's very easy to generate peak tables. And we can edit them with the same tools that we used for the 2D. And uh, is this compatible with uh, programs like IPINE? The table that format you write it out. The table is just like we saw before. It's an ordinary text table with spaces between the columns. And we have our own way to label the names of the axes. We have a facility to convert this into a CSV table. That is a comma separated values table. So you, you without too much trouble, you can take this text file and convert it to forms where it could be used by other software. I see. Thank you. So actually, let's see if we can do this. So this is something... Uh, that's also really useful about the facilities of NMR pipe. We have many different ways to manipulate tables inside a script and to extract values from a table so that we can build scripts where the information in one table is used to guide processing and analysis in some other uh, part of the application. Let's see. Well, I don't even remember. So the tool we have for extracting columns from a peak table it's called get tab columns. We'll read in this peak table that we made. We'll write a result in CSV format. Um, we'll give it a header. And put the result in a table. So there's our CSV file with the header information that came from the original peak table. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Frank, this is Krish. Yes. Um, I have a question which may be a little bit um, offline for this discussion. Mm -hmm. But the, your description of smile uh, made me sit up. Um, I am exclusive. I have been exclusively using ISC. Um, mm -hmm. So, do you want to give some idea do's and don'ts or um, preference of one over the other? Right. Yeah. That... ISC is, is works great. It's just slow. That's that's a great question. So. Let's look at a particular case. Um, let's look at a couple of cases, in fact, to explain a little bit about this. Let's just do this. Um, all right. So
This is 2D NUS data of a monoclonal antibody, of course. <laughs> so let's go through the steps of processing it. And I just do a regular FT, and I can see that there's likely a 90-degree phase correction in the indirect dimension. And this is uh, proton carbon data, so I only need a limited chemical shift range in this part of the spectrum. So I'm going to reduce the chemical shift range to uh, 3.5 to minus 1.5, let's say. And I'll turn on auto phasing for the directly detected dimension. Now update the script and just execute a regular FT. Okay, so here's the regular FT. I'm satisfied with the phase correction and the Fourier transform modes. So now we can go about processing this. And to start with, let's use IST, which as you point out is terribly slow. NMR pipes IST is really slow, but it gives very good results. It's very good, yeah. I, I, I will vote for that every time. Right, so here's the result and it looks pretty nice. I'll go down in contour level so we can see where things start to fall apart. So right now, this is a contour level. Well, okay, hold on, let me. Let me do this. So what I've done for convenience is to adjust the processing script so that the final result is rescaled to a maximum of 100 so that we can look at the contour levels and be able to better compare them from one result to another. So this is what things look like at a contour level of 1.5 with an IST reconstruction. Okay. Now let's use a smile reconstruction on this data. And now we'll look and here's how things look at 1.5. So you see there are substantially more artifacts in the smile version of the spectrum. And this is going to happen specifically in cases where there are heavy amounts of overlap in the spectrum. In every other case, smile is going to do really well and much faster, maybe 10 or 100 times faster than uh, NMR pipes IST. But for very crowded spectra, it won't do as well as HMS IST or NMR pipes IST does. And the reason for that, let's see if I can, uh, what can I do? We can do some annotation. Let's try that. So if you could kind of imagine Now, why can't I do annotation? Sorry, I'm trying to get Zoom to do what I want it to. Uh, annotate, okay, let's try that. No, it won't let me do that. All right, we'll try something altogether different. The way SMILE works is it identifies a maximum and checks to see about how wide the peak is and then goes through its list of models 
and finds a model that matches that line width. Okay. And that's what it uses as a synthetic signal. But you can imagine that if there are two peaks um, that overlap, it's first going to try to make an estimate for this peak. And because the peaks overlap, the true line width and height of this peak is different from the apparent line width when you look at these peaks in overlap. So in this case, it's going to make a model for the biggest peak, but that model isn't perfect. So we'll be left with the second peak when that model is subtracted, but there'll also be a little bit of an extra residual that there shouldn't be. And now Smile will go through and model this peak. And that will also be a little bit distorted because of this here. So there's still going to be a residual. And then Smile will now model this little negative peak. So Smile is eventually going to describe these two overlapping peaks as best as possible. But it's always going to do it with more signals than are strictly needed. And so these little imperfections, uh, these small differences in the model, once they drop below the noise level, Smile is going to stop and be left with these small systematic differences. Mm. So for crowded spectra, um, Smile may not be the best choice in every case. So I don't know. Does uh, that make some sense? Yeah, yeah. So when you say the line, it 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 estimates a line with. It. So obviously, it is using the Fourier transform result to right. So let's off. see if I can uh, okay. stop the annotation. Um, where do we go? The way SMILE works is that it begins by making a list of different decays from the lowest value you expect to the highest value that you expect uh, in fine increments. And then it takes each one of these decays and multiplies them by the sampling schedule and Fourier transforms those results. So this gives us a collection of what an individual signal would look like in the spectrum. So when you see a, a signal that's this narrow in the spectrum, you know that it has this decay. If you see a spectrum that has this line width in the spectrum, you know that it has this decay and so on. So this procedure is very good for isolated peaks but the more and more crowded the spectrum becomes, the more and more of an approximate guess this is. So more, a larger number of artificial terms are needed to describe overlapping signals. Mm -hmm. All right, does that make some sense? Okay, yeah, thank you. Excellent, very good.
I like these questions. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so uh, we looked at this result. That's very good. So what else shall we look at? Um, hi, can I ask a question? Yeah, please do. So I wonder if it's possible to do referencing. Like, can you reference your spectral here? Yeah, that's a great question. That is a great question. Um, there are a few different things to do about referencing. Um, and the two cases are when you have an actual reference signal in the data that you can use to establish chemical shift, or if you have some other method that allows you to decide. And I want to encourage you, whenever it's possible, if you need to re-reference spectrum, go back and adjust the conversion scripts so that they generate raw spectral data that has the correct conversion uh, and chemical shift calibration parameters in it so that if you ever go back and need to reconstruct the data, it will automatically be corrected, correctly chemical shift calibrated, and you won't have to do any interactive adjustments. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at a few different methods. What I'm doing is searching for scripts that have this kind of reference calculation in them. Okay, here we go. This particular data set is yet another collection of monoclonal antibody spectra. Three different samples. And in this case, oh, I've only converted the spectrum. Okay, that's the process. All right, I'm processing this spectrum. So here's what it looked like. Oh, this is uh, non-uniformly sampled data, sorry. So let's do that reconstruction properly. All right, so here's our spectrum, and this particular spectral data has a reference, a chemical shift reference compound in there. All right, so there is the peak. If I expand it, so this peak should be at zero ppm in the proton dimension, 
And in the indirect dimension, it just so happens that this peak is folded. So its chemical shift position in the indirect dimension uh, correctly should be zero. But since it's folded, it will be whatever the spectral width is in ppm. So for example, if this indirect dimension is 30 ppm, then this uh, chemical shift calibration peak would be at 30 ppm, all right? So we can do this interactively inside NMR draw. That's one option. So I can point to a peak of interest. And then under the file menu, there's an option called calibrate axis. And that lets me specify the chemical shift value at this location. Okay, and then I can save it with the data. So that's one way. We also have a way to do this under script control with a, an application called Ref2D. And there's a 1D and 3D version. But basically what this application does is you give it a rough region of where the reference peak is. And it does peak detection in that region and finds the biggest peak and assigns that peak whatever chemical shift value you think it should have. So in the uncalibrated data, it looks like um, we could go between 0.05 ppm and uh, minus 0.006 ppm, and the peak would be somewhere in there, and maybe between 27 ppm and 28 or 29 ppm. So let's see, ref2d.tcl, and the name of the spectrum is here. And we'll go, let's say, from 05 ppm to minus 0 0.06 ppm. And then I can't remember what I said. We'll say 27 ppm to 29 ppm. I don't know. And in this case, it's going to set both of those to zero. So if I look at the peak again, did that work? Oh, no, I didn't do that. We've got to make a peak table. Very good. So now, if we look at this, no, it didn't work. What did I do wrong? 27 to 28. Did that work better? It did, yes. Okay, so now the peak is positioned at zero ppm. And in fact, if we do peak detection, we should see zero ppm there okay so those are the two ways of doing chemical shift calibration one interactively within the software and the other from uh, a script-based command line option that you can put inside of other scripts thank you can you also do it on the 1d data yes um, so one day you can interactively calibrate in NMR draw, just like we saw, and the corresponding application for doing the calibration, uh, the command line is called ref1d.tcl. And basically it's the same idea. 
you specify the chemical shift range where you expect the reference peak will be, and you specify what value you would like that chemical shift to be after the calibration is complete. Thank you. Yep. Good question. All right. We are getting close to the end of our time together. Is there anything in particular anyone might like to see or ask? That is a question primarily for the Ivan team about where the recordings are. I think they all Ivan workshop recordings are in YouTube channel. You should also be able to come to IvanMR.com website and get links uh, to all recordings. Typically, it takes few days for Eric to curate and post it in the YouTube channel. Hi, Frank. I have what might be, a, I hope is a quick question. If someone is going to start a new project, is there a place where they should look to see what sort of general tools mm -hmm. might be available in Pipe? That's a great question. And that I would suggest that the thing to do is download the demo data archive and just take a look at what's in there. And each one of these directories has a, a readme file or some other kind of description that explains what to do. So what we have in here are a spectral comparison of 1D and 2D series, basic 2D and 3D processing, analysis of cest experiments, refinement of a structure against dipolar couplings, some simple dozy analysis, uh, an analysis of a J-modulated 2D series, an example of how to process magnitude mode data, an example of processing 4D data, an example of NMR homology search, which is searching for fragments of known structures who simulated chemical shifts and dipolar couplings, match measured data. Here's an example of fixing bad points that happened from receiver overflow. Um, examples of analyzing spectral, 1D spectral series, 2D relaxation, um, the excipient subtraction that we looked at before, simulating 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D, Another one, the example with different spectra of soy, dietary supplements, um, STD analysis, another T1 relaxation analysis, chemical shift titration analysis that we saw before, and uh, a general example of uh, related triple resonance spectra as would be used in sequential assignment. And we saw those too. So... The thing to do is to look through these examples and match them to what you have in mind. And if you don't find the example that you want, the next thing to do is to write to me and ask about it. Thanks. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, can you comment on the Are use there any of other questions? Mouse? Yes, I was going to see. Yeah. Uh, I'm a bit confused on how you use the mouse in NMR draw. Oh. Like, uh, yeah. So I wonder if you can give us a quick. Um, sure. Demo. Yes, Thanks. we can do that. All right, so here's our example spectrum. And you'll notice that the top border of the program has some messages about what kind of things the mouse can do. And for 2D and 3D and 4D data, by default, when nothing else is happening, if you move the mouse pointer out 
to the outside border of the program and move the scroll wheel. So I'm moving the scroll wheel now. I can increase or decrease the contour levels. So I'm doing that with the scroll wheel right now. Scrolling up and scrolling down. Now, if I do something like view one dimensional slices in the horizontal dimension, the top border again tells me what the mouse buttons do. And the mouse buttons do one thing when the mouse pointer is inside the spectral viewing area and they do a different set of things when the mouse pointer is in the axis area. So according to this message, when the mouse pointer is outside, the left button adjusts the phase pivot, the middle button adjusts the vertical scale, and the right button adjusts the vertical offset. So I'm gonna try those different ones. So I'm using the right button, and that's changing the vertical offset. I'm using the middle button, and that changes the vertical scale. And now for the phase pivot, the phase pivot for this spectrum is associated with this horizontal dimension. So I'm going to point the mouse in the horizontal axis, and now I'm dragging with the left button. And if you look closely, you could see as I drag, the two little arrow marks appear. That's the position of the phase pivot. And you might also notice as I drag the mouse, to change this phase pivot position, the actual point position of the phase pivot is here. Pragmatics, this is Eric, my health analyst. Say that again. I, I'm having an awful lot of trouble hearing you. There's a big echo. Okay, very sorry. Let's see what I can do about that. I, uh... I, again, I'm not understanding because of the echo. Can you try and call me back? Can you try? Thank you. Eric, you are you need to be muted. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought uh, those were questions directed at me. Uh, anyway, so yes, I'm I'm using the uh, left mouse button to move the phase pivot. And as I move it, you can actually see the position of the phase pivot and points. So those are the things that we do with the mouse. And there are a couple of other mouse actions. Um, when interactive phasing is on, we can drag these sliders with the mouse. And if you click on the sliders, instead of dragging them, you can increment or decrement the phase value as opposed to sliding it continuously. So those are the mouse functions of the software and the different things that you can do with the mouse are view horizontal slices, view vertical slices, view them in both dimensions, uh, view the Z and A axis, <laughs> if you like, and view the 2D location. So you can point to a different position and you'll see the chemical shifts of that position and also the information associated with that position. So if you look at the top border, it shows you where this cursor is in points and PPM and what the real intensity and imaginary intensity of the corresponding data is. So there's that. Thank you. Yeah, good question. So I think we're at the conclusion of today's discussion. Thank you for all the questions and for your patience in listening. Hope to see you all at the next Ivan meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Frank. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And happy holidays. We'll see you in January.